There is no single solution to climate change, but there is one technology that if we can get it to work, might be nuclear fusion. How close is it? And can we get it to work? Is it really that good? There aren't a lot of jokes about energy technology. Actually, I only know one. Nuclear fusion is 30 years away and always will be. People have been saying that for at least 50 years, and it was true, if not particularly funny. But I'm here to tell you that there's been so much progress in the field that now the joke is nuclear fusion is 10 years away and always will be. Or maybe this time it's for real. Until about 10 years ago, nuclear fusion research took place at government or academic labs where schedules were measured in decades and progress was measured in academic papers. ITER, or the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, is an example of the old way of researching fusion. The current project dates from 2007, and they're hoping to get first plasma in 2033. It will cost over $20 billion and result in a reactor capable of generating energy, but not in a way that is commercially useful. But now there are scores of companies working on developing commercially viable reactors. As of 2024, private investors have sunk $7.1 billion into companies working on fusion. These companies all talk about schedules in years, not decades. Helion has signed a power purchase agreement with Microsoft. Commonwealth Fusion Systems has an agreement with the Commonwealth of Virginia to build their first grid-connected power plant there. What I find most promising is that these companies are exploring many different concepts on how to crack this nut. One thing they all have in common is they haven't demonstrated a working reactor or even something close. Welcome to Decarbonize's series on nuclear fusion. In this video, I'll explain what nuclear fusion is, why it's harder than nuclear fission, and why it's better if we can get it to work. Then in the following videos, I'll dive into a handful of companies that are developing different concepts on how to create a mini sun. But here's my spoiler alert. Almost all of them will fail. But if one or two of them succeed, it's game changing. And all the companies I'll talk about and many others have viable ideas that may succeed. The atomic nucleus is filled with positively charged protons and uncharged neutrons. Isn't it great when physicists give things names that actually make sense? As you might remember, positive electrical charges repeal each other. So why doesn't a collection of protons squeezed into an unfathomably small space fly apart? Good question. So let's talk about the four fundamental forces of physics. Try to say that five times fast. First, there's the weak nuclear force, which we can ignore because it's weak. Then there's the gravitational force, which is important on a planetary scale, all the way to understanding the entire universe but it isn't important on the atomic scale, so we can ignore it. The electromagnetic force is critical at this scale. It's what allows chemistry to happen, powers electric motors, why objects feel solid, why we can see, how radios work, and the list goes on and on. It's also what drives the protons in the nucleus to want to be as far from each other by what's called Coulomb repulsion, and that is critical. And the closer two protons get to each other, the stronger this repulsion is. And finally, there's the strong nuclear force, which is strong, but only over short distances. And I mean very short. To give you a sense of how short, imagine an atom the size of the Earth. Then the range of the strong nuclear force would be about the length of a football field. So if you get protons and neutrons close enough to each other, the strong nuclear force will bind them into a nucleus. Looking at this plot of binding energy per nucleon, we see it peaks near iron. What that means is that iron is very stable. Quick aside on nomenclature. 
the letter tells you what the element is, which is also the number of protons. H is hydrogen with one proton. He is helium with two. Li is lithium with three, and on through the periodic table. The superscript number to the left is the number of nucleons, protons plus neutrons. 2H is also known as deuterium. 3H is known as tritium. These are the isotopes of hydrogen. If we look over to the right, we see large elements like uranium and plutonium have less binding energy, which means that if you split them into two smaller atoms, more similar to iron, then there's a bit of energy to release. That's nuclear fission. If we look to the left, we see small atoms like hydrogen and helium are far below iron, which means that if we can combine two deuterium atoms into one helium atom, there's an enormous amount of energy released. So back to fusion, which is the battle between electromagnetism, wanting to push protons apart, and the strong nuclear force wanting to get them together. And electromagnetism will win unless the protons are so very close. And fusion does happen. This is not just a theory. In the center of every star, you can see there's a furnace of hot, dense plasma held together by the gravity of the star. The particles of hydrogen are moving so fast that sometimes, if they're aligned perfectly, the kinetic energy of the hydrogen nuclei will overcome the Coulomb repulsion, and the nuclei will come close enough together for the strong nuclear force to become significant, and they will fuse and release energy. This is the process that has been powering the sun for billions of years to date, and will continue to power the sun for billions yet to come. Another place we see fusion is in a hydrogen bomb. The core of the bomb is a ball of deuterium and tritium. If we squeeze this hard enough together to get the hydrogen to fuse into helium, we get a huge release of energy. And to do that, we surround the core with a fission bomb. Imagine a bomb big enough that a device the size of the Hiroshima bomb is just the detonator. Fusion can also occur in the lab most notably at the National Ignition Facility at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. They fired 192 lasers at a capsule the size of a peppercorn containing the two forms of heavy hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. The laser light squeezed the capsule, resulting in a very hot, dense plasma. The energy released from the hydrogen fusing into the helium was 1.5 times the energy that struck the fuel pellet. This metric is known as Q. Since the lasers aren't very efficient, the energy taken from the grid was much more than the energy the laser sent to the pellet. This was an impressive scientific achievement, but nowhere close to a useful path to generating electricity. I've been using the term plasma, and you might not know what that is. It sounds like something very high tech. But a plasma is just a hot gas. It's hot enough to glow. By definition, it's hot enough that at least one electron has been liberated from every atom. A candle flame is a plasma. The inside of a neon tube is a plasma. And the hotter it gets, the faster everything moves around. And because all of the particles are charged, they're influenced by magnetic fields, which is important for many of the concepts around fusion. So how hot of a plasma do we need to get nuclear fusion? Around 150 million degrees Celsius. At that temperature, the nuclei are moving so fast that some of them will overcome the Coulomb repulsion and get close enough for the strong force to allow the hydrogen to fuse into helium. For context, the surface of the sun is about 6,000 degrees Celsius. Lightning, which is a plasma, is about 30,000 degrees Celsius. So that's why fusion is hard. But then why do we bother? There are several reasons that, if we can get it to work, fusion is much better than fission. One we've already talked about. The energy available from fusing hydrogen into helium is so much more than that from splitting uranium or plutonium. Another is that 
the fusion products, like helium, are inert. The only radioactive waste is that some materials, when struck by a neutron, can become radioactive. But careful reactor design can limit or even remove this issue. Another advantage is safety. Fission reactors are quite safe, but Fukushima is still a mess. If a fusion reactor has a loss of power, it just stops working. The worst case is an escape of tritium, which is radioactive hydrogen with a half-life of 12 years. Since it's a form of hydrogen, the lightest element, it will just disperse into the atmosphere. Most of it will combine with oxygen and form water, which will fall into the ocean where it will harmlessly decay. That's the worst case. Most reactor designs are fueled by two isotopes of heavy hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. Deuterium can easily be extracted from seawater. Tritium is a bit more of a challenge, but it can be transmuted from lithium-6 with a neutron. The lithium-6 can be separated out from the more common lithium-7 as a part of refining lithium for battery production. Some companies are planning on using helium-3 with deuterium rather than tritium, which can be mined on the moon. There's even a startup with refugees from Blue Origin working on this. For more details, I recommend the underappreciated Sam Rockwell movie, Moon. I also recommend Mr. Wright, Jojo Rabbit, and everything else he's in, but those don't have anything to do with decarbonization. But there's an easier way to get helium-3 than going to the moon, and that's deuterium-deuterium fusion reaction, which creates a helium-3 nuclei half the time and a tritium one the other half. The tritium can either be sold to a fusion company using the deuterium-tritium reaction, or you can wait about 12 years until it decays into helium-3. In my upcoming videos, I'll talk about some of the exciting companies that are working on fusion. I have some in mind, but if you have a favorite, please let me know in the comments. All of the companies I'll be talking about, I think, have at least a 10% chance of success and give a sense of the variety of approaches that are being explored. If you'd like to support this channel, you can buy me a Guinness. I'd also like to thank the reviewers who gave me great input, and this video is all the better for it. And you can click here to see more of my videos on nuclear power. And please forward this video on to anyone you know who doesn't understand the difference between fission and fusion.